So, I'm, I'm really happy to be here in Russia, uh, really happy to be with you. I know that some of them have already met them in Belgium or in France, and it has always been a pleasure. Um, so, I'm, I'm happy now to be here with all of you to discuss what has changed in spinal muscular atrophy. So, um, as you know, probably a, a man is nothing without a team. Uh, so, uh, I was working in Paris, where some of you came, um, and I'm now working mainly in Belgium and in Oxford, uh, in the UK. Okay, so, um, I'm going to talk a lot today. <laughs> Um, and, 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 and we will start with the changes in the landscape, so just some new in SMA treatment. So I will, I will try to give a broad overview and we will go more into the details hopefully during these two days. So I have a couple of disclosures, they are there. Um, so, when we speak about spinal muscular atrophy, we don't speak about a single type of patient. It's a broad phenotypic spectrum. It starts with the SMA type 1, um, which was called when I was a baby doctor, Wernick Hoffman disease. And I always been very, uh, you know, astonished by these very bright eyes. Those kids, when you go in the in the waiting room, they look at you like this with the big eyes, and it's really easy to make the diagnosis just by looking how the kid is looking at you. But unfortunately, it's a very severe disease, and um, about 80% of these kids will either die, either need a tracheostomy within the age of two years. If they survive thanks to very supportive care, they may survive until adulthood and we have more and more adults with SMA type 1, but with a very severe condition. But the intellect is always normal and this last years because of this new treatment I've seen many many of these adult SMA type 1 going to me so we have all one or two patients, but all of a sudden with this new treatment, I've seen many of these patients. And I was really surprised how many things they have done in their life. I've, I've met one deputy at the national level, one deputy at the European level, um, a guy who told me, uh, you know, I made my first business, I sold it, I made another business, I sold it, and now I'm a billionaire and I'm traveling around the world. Uh, so it's impressive the realization of these patients. And of course they are less severe form, like the type 2, uh, who is able uh, to sit but not to walk, and the type 3, who is going to acquire ambulation and then lose it in 50% of patients. 
есть, конечно, и менее тяжелые случаи, как тип второй и тип третий. При втором человек может сидеть, но не может ходить. При третьем э, может ходить, но в 50% случаев он теряет эту способность постепенно. I always we say, well, this is the milder form, but should we call the mild a disease for which you lose ambulation at the age of 10 years? It's just because we benchmark with a very severe disease, but in comparison, it's a little bit like Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We say so, in all these patients, I've always been fascinated by these bright eyes and this easiness to enter into contact with you. I used to call them the anti-autistic kids. Okay, and this uh, uh, easiness to enter into contact with you, this smiling and selective attitude, they will keep it uh, through childhood and adult life, and there is huge seductor uh, uh, among these patients. Посмотрите, вот это легкость в общении, легкость а, а, в контакте, она сохраняется у ребенка а, на всю оставшуюся жизнь. Посмотрите, даже взрослые пациенты, а, какие очаровательные. So, uh, I used to say that it's the first symptom of SMA. Uh, it's these bright eyes, this smiling and selective attitude, very intelligent case. Nevertheless, um, they have also symptoms, right? <laughs> And, um, <laughs> which is mainly hypotonia, uh, which is actual, and proximal, maybe lower limb, areflexia and the tongue fasciculations. And few contractures in comparison with other neuromuscular disease, and few facial weakness only in the severe cases. I think that it's more than ever important to recapitulate the signs, the clinical signs, because with this new treatment coming, I will say today and the day after today the same things again and again and again. The earliest we treat, the better it is. And we will treat early if we are able to recognize the disease. So it's very, it's very important the medical awareness of, uh, of this disease. And medical awareness passed by the recognition of the core symptoms of the disease. Я всегда говорю, что самое важное это распознавать основные симптомы. И, как я всегда утверждаю, важно начать лечение как можно раньше. И поэтому симптомы надо знать на зубок. Окей. So, you have to study it very carefully, okay? Вот это вам придется хорошенько изучить. Just joking. So, let, let me tell you this slide in a snapshot. Um, this, uh, all the forms of SMA, of SMA, whatever is the form of the baby or the form of the adult that you still all can have, are due to the same mutation of this gene SMN1. So, um, all patients, but 5%, let's say all, to, be, to make simple, have a deletion of this exon 7 of SMN1. So how is it possible? Um, it's, it's because we have another gene that is called SMN2. 
and SMN2 is exactly like SMN1. Just the same. But there is a simple little difference here. And because of this little difference, this exon 7 goes away during the splicing process in the most of cases so there is only a few percentage of, of full protein that, that is produced from this SMN2 gene so it means that whatever everybody has the same um, deletion of SMN1 but if you if you, have, if you have few copies of SMN2, you, you will have a silver form like SMA1. And if you have and if you have a lot of copies, like four or five copies, you can hope to have a less silver form. <coughs> but this is not an absolute truth. It means that you may have patients with less liver <laughs> form <laughs> and two copies. <laughs> and you may have patients with a <laughs> more liver <laughs> form and four copies <laughs> because they are other modifiers. <laughs> but it's the most important point is the number of copies of SMN2. And this opens a possibility for treatment because if we could by one way or another avoid this splicing of exon 7 then we will have many more protein produced from SMN 2G. Okay, there is a lot of things that have changed in SMA um, for 12 years now. In 2007, we had the first standard of care published. In 2017, we had a new version of standard of care, and at that time, we got the new treatment coming. And, and comes to question um, which treatment, because there are now three, four, five patient treatments, different treatments at patient's bedside. <laughs> and the second question is when? And when? Um, the answer is very easy, it's as soon as possible. And as soon as possible, you can achieve it by two strategies. The first one is disease awareness, so it means to explain to the doctors what is the disease and how to recognize the disease. But it doesn't work that well. And the, the, a better strategy is certainly newborn screening. We will talk today about newborn screening. In, new, in Belgium, we have started newborn screening in 2018. And so the question that we have today is newborn screening, okay, but then early treatment, and the question is which one, and then which follow-up for patients who have been treated, and this is still an open question. So for sure we will need soon um, another version of standard of care. So um, I will not go into the detail of standard of care, this is the topic of another lecture. 
Не буду много рассказывать про стандарты лечения, это тема другой лекции. But I, I, I want to emphasize how important it is before to start speaking about any treatment. There is no treatment that will work outside standard of care. None of this treatment has been studied outside standard of care. So, um, a first strategy to treat would be to, as I told you, to try to try to, to interfere with the splicing of the RNA of the cement to, to help keeping exon seven and to keep to, to try to keep exon seven uh, within the area. And we can do it with small molecules that will interfere with the splicing process. These are the products from Roche and from Novartis, so Branapalm and Rizipalm. And I think that both drugs now are studied also here in Russia. Указанные медикаменты как раз содержат такие молекулы, и я считаю, что, мне кажется, эти медикаменты уже доступны даже и в России. And the other possibilities is to use an antisense that will interfere with the splicing, and this is the nusinersen, the spinraza, that is now approved for two days in Russia. И, соответственно, у нас есть еще антисенс, который тоже используется, и он тоже And another approach would be to use this little Sputnik, which is an RV9, and to put into a, a new gene, SMN1, that will go into uh, the nucleus and break a new copy of SMN1. We can also think about acting downstream on the muscle. It means, for instance, after having corrected the primary defect in the motor neurons, to give drugs that make muscles stronger and bigger. Like, for instance, antimyostatin, which is a drug that aims to make muscle bigger and stronger. So, um, all of this um, is either approved, um, either in late stage clinical development, Avexis is now approved uh, in the United States, not yet in Europe. The Roche product is in phase three, and Novartis product is in phase one, phase two. Um, and there is no, uh, no new treatments coming in early phase um, for uh, muscle uh, uh, therapy. Как вы видите, эти медикаменты они либо уже утверждены, либо находятся на стадии тестирования. Некоторые уже применены в Европе, в США, и есть еще новые разработки с этой кинетики, которые вот еще проходят первые стадии клинических испытаний. Just to illustrate this different approach, I, I present you Agata. She's a very good friend of mine. She's from Poland, and she's a painter. And, and Agata, she's a painter, and unfortunately, she lost the ability to paint when she was like 45 years old. She was not able to to keep the 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 the, the, the pencil in her hand anymore. К сожалению, она потеряла возможность рисовать в возрасте 44 лет. Она не может рукой держать карандаш. And she told me losing the ability to 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 paint to, to, uh, was for me even worse than losing the ability to walk because I lost the ability to to go outside my body to go and uh, to go in my, the imagination and to be able to paint. Она сказала, что потеря такой способности 
способности рисовать для нее тяжелее, чем если бы она не смогла больше ходить. Потому что рисунок это то, что позволяет развивать ее воображение и выходить за рамки реального мира. So that was the objective for the treatment. It was not to walk, to run or whatever, just to be able again to paint. And, and, and she, she, uh, she recovered the ability of painting uh, with music nursing treatment and, and she made us a fa fantastic gift. She, she made a, a painting of everybody in my team. Она действительно восстановила эту способность благодаря указанным медикаментам, и она действительно теперь снова рисует, она нарисовала всю нашу команду. So this is um, uh, me, uh, uh, with me right um, This is uh, uh, me with uh, Avexis AB9, um, and this is me with this sunfish, jewel fish, fire fish, and rainbow fish trial. Um, and, um, and this is me with the antimyostatin. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I just show this because I love showing pictures of me, but also <laughs> because I, I truly think that it's very uh, small things that may change quality of life, and that just being able to recover something, or to gain a new acquisition rather than to lose something, is very important for patients, especially for adult patients. Я показываю эти картинки не потому, что не только лишь потому, что я люблю показывать картинки самого себя, но и потому, что я хочу вам сказать, что мелочи очень важны. Видите, восстановить какую-то маленькую способность, маленькую двигательную способность меняет качество жизни. So, um, the, the first, uh, the, the last data we have on, on this nursing is very crucial for two days in, in uh, Russia. Um, so uh, we have at first patients with type 1. Patients with type 1 were, in were included in a double blind randomized placebo control study. What does it mean, a double blind? <laughs> It means that we, we didn't know which patient was on treatment and which patient was on placebo. Even if it was a, a, a disease that was uh, killing the babies within six months. Just to explain you how sometimes these clinical trials can be heartbreaking, heartbreaking and difficult for the patients and the doctors. And so at the end of this trial, all patients surviving could go either on nursing, they were on nursing on, on placebo, and they could be follow up uh, receiving nursing at the end of the trial. So um, we started with 81 patients at first um, in this trial who received uh, uh, music nursing, and they were only 65 after, uh, let's say, nine months. And if patients were on placebo, only 24 were surviving. So nowadays we have, been, we have 1,000 of days or nearly three years of follow-up in patients on using nursing and about two years of follow-up in patients who are treated late because they receive the placebo. So, this is a scale that is the sharp intent, which is a motor scale. And so these are the patients who have not received anything, just the placebo. <laughs> if at the end of one year you give them the treatment, they start improving. 
but not as fast as patients who have received the medication at first. Но прогресс не такой большой, как у тех пациентов, которые сразу начали получать медикаменты. Especially if they have received the injections after before the age of five months, five months and half. Особенно если пациенты получали медикаменты в виде инъекций с раннего возраста, например, пяти месяцев. So what does it mean? It means that if you don't treat for sure, the patients are going worse. It means that if you treat late, you still can see some improvement. But if we want the drug to be very efficient, we must give it as soon as possible. So in the group of patients who have been treated before the age of five months, we have 60% of patients who are sitting today. In patients who have been treated after the age of five months, only 38%. And in patients who were not in the Nusinersen group, so who were treated after the age of one year, we have zero percent of sitters. And in the group of patients who have been treated early, we have 10 percent of workers, but with assistance. What does it mean for families? What does it mean for parents? It, me it means that if we have to treat as soon as possible, if we want the best uh, efficacy of the treatment, it means that if we treat after the symptoms, we can improve the patients, but the patients will never be normal. There is not a single one of these patients who is working alone, so patients treated after the symptoms unfortunately will never be normal. <coughs> and it also means that you have a certain percentage of patients who sit, a certain percentage of patients who work, but it's not all patients, so they are good responders, and not as good responders. <coughs> okay, in type 2, we have a similar study. A double-blind randomized placebo control study. And after this, after this period of blinding, after 14 months, we could follow the patients and they all received the treatment. <coughs> so that's the baseline characteristic of these patients, just to show you that the, they were quite young when they started, like the, me, the, the median was like five years. Um, and so this this is a model scale, and these are patients who are receiving the treatment. If you give the placebo, you have a placebo effect. But the placebo effect doesn't last. And then if you treat them, uh, they start improving a little bit, but definitely not, not the same level of patients who have been treated earlier. And the only difference between these guys and these guys is 14 months. 
So it means that if these guys have been treated 14 months earlier than these guys, so 14 months is a big deal in terms of treatment response. Um, this is another way of looking at the data. Let's not look at the data like, uh, are you on using nursing at first or are you on treatment at first? But let's try to look at the data, how old were you when we started the treatment? And, um, of course, you can, uh, if, you are, if you were younger than five years when you started, oh, oh, sorry, younger than three years when you started the treatment, you have a very positive evolution. If you are like younger than four years, it's still okay. Let's say younger than five years, but if you were older than five years, then the evolution is not that good. So we must figure out that the difference between these guys and these guys is just a matter of one year and a half of starting the treatment. It means that if we want to treat, we really have to treat early. So, for me, the, 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 the dream is, of course, uh, the uh, pre-symptomatic patients, because I'm pretty sure that we will not need a scale uh, to see these patients doing better, and we will stop seeing those little angels uh, climbing to the sky. So, um, there is a study that will be published soon um, of 25 patients who are receiving who are receiving nusinersen before uh, the symptoms. So, 25 patients were, were enrolled, um, uh, 15 with 2 copies of SMN2 and 10 with 3 copies. And um, if this is the evolution of patients who are not treated, this is the evolution of patients who have been treated late, this is the evolution of patients who have been treated after the symptoms but before the age of 7 months, and this is the evolution of patients who have been treated before the symptoms and I have two copies of SMN2. And this is patients with three copies of SMN2 treated before the symptoms. So as you may appreciate, there is not a matter of comparison. These patients are doing much better if they are treated before the symptoms. So um, let's just have a look at this video. Uh, can you have the video? So this young man, um, oh sorry, uh, this video, yeah, yes there, yeah. So this guy, um, is, he's a brother and she's a sister. Um, and the brother has been treated after the symptoms. He's doing better, 
Его so should be adding autonomous sitting position. And um, he now very able to sit without support. He still needs the support of his mates. But this 11 months old uh, baby is uh, strictly normal, and, and, and you can show her to any neurologist, any pediatrician. Nobody will be able to see something. She has a normal upper lip function. If I ask this guy to give me this head, he will not do it because he doesn't understand his Polish. But hey, if we translate, he has to use all his muscles to do it. And this one is normal. A little bit later, uh, this guy still needs uh, to support his head. And this is what she does when she wants to look at her in the mirror. So that's what we call the big yellow plastic duct test. The big yellow plastic duct test. So um, if we, if you hear that skull fracture can be a consequence of presentimental treatment, it's maybe because of this one. No, so This is a presymptomatic treatment. This is a post-symptomatic treatment. <laughs> so one year later, um, we make a new test. Is the ten stairs carrying baby test? And she scored the best score you can do in the 10 stairs carrying baby test. So six months later we had to invent the 10 stairs climbing bike test. So just joking to, to show you that this kid is strictly normal, okay? So it means that if we want to achieve the best efficacy of this treatment, we must treat as soon as possible and we must treat before the symptoms. So when you have such patients, you, you dream every night about newborn screening and you think um, every day about newborn screening. Okay, so this is from my hometown in Namur and this is the guy who measured the cloud. So it's a, it's a representation of Utopia. And so, uh, with my partners in France, Tamara Bankulov, uh, we wanted to, to raise a new bond screening program in Belgium within the six months. And we did it, so we started March 5th, 2018. <laughs> what really helped to make politicians moving was to have a lot of public engagement, mainstream media. So, <laughs> so we had a Facebook page. So on which all videos of patients and all testimony of patients are available. You can download the new adventure of Sofia, the climbing kid with the bike. <laughs> so I expect at least 50 new friends from Russia on the Facebook page today. <laughs> Как минимум 50 новых подписчиков из России.
<laughs> so, and it really helps to make things moving because politicians, they go on Facebook, they go on Twitter, and they don't go on the scientific site, and they don't read the very intelligent newspaper, they read the mainstream newspaper. If you want to make things moving, mainstream media and Facebook page are really important. That's how we convince the ministry in Belgium. Политики читают соцсети, Facebook. Они не читают умные научные статьи. Поэтому, если э, вы хотите, чтобы э, власти о чем-то знали, приглашайте их на соцсети, э, мейнстрим информацию э, предлагайте им. Videos are extremely important. I mean, you you understand much more with a simple video of these two kids. Глядя на than with any graph or any histogram. So you can download the video, you can use this video if you want to make things moving in your community. Okay, so that, uh, uh, we created 40,000 newborns so far and we could identify six cases. Who are now uh, uh, treated before the symptoms. So I have not seen I have not seen and my interns in Belgium have not seen a new SMA patients for like one year and a half because we treat them before they are symptomatic. So to train my intern, I have to send them in France to see patients. So that's how it is, but I will not go through it because it's a little bit technical. Um, but, but a very important question is, should we treat or not patients with four copies of SMN2? And, and basically we don't know, because these patients will start the symptoms maybe at the age of 10 years, so should we treat them at birth? This is still an open question. Okay, so um, I don't know if you know this guy. I, I know this one, he's one of my patients. <laughs> and so, um, what can we realistically expect from this nursing? We can expect in type 1 less than 7 months to take 13 points on this ID scale over 3 years. <laughs> In patients who are older than seven months, the expectation is lower. In patients with type 2, if they are less than five years, we may, we may expect an increase of three points on this scale of per year. In type 3, we may expect mild improvement. And, 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 and my impression is that mainly on fatigue, that's what report my patients, less fatigue. In patients with two copies to be subnormal, presymptomatic patients with, uh, and, and patients presymptomatic with three copies to be normal. So, um, what are the, the, the data we have today with uh, gene therapy? So, there's a paper that has been published um, on a cohort of 12 patients with type 1. This was with the therapeutic dose. And as you can see, patients, if they are treated early, they have a very good uh, improvement. If they are treated late, the improvement is not that good. So, 
I will not spend too much time now on this because I will give the talk for Avexis tomorrow. So I will. It's the same audience, Olga. Okay. So tomorrow I will go more in the details of this data from Avexis because there was the, there is the talk of Avexis. Um, so it's just teasing for tomorrow. <laughs> so these data have been partially reproduced on a larger cohort of patients in the US and in Europe. As you can see, this is a little the same evolution, especially for patients who have been treated early. And the beauty is, uh, one more time, the pre-symptomatic patients, uh, this is um, in gray, the, the normal zone, and these patients um, are moving into the normal zone, except this one we, we need to know, because maybe he was crying that day, so we need to know a little bit on this one. The other patients treated before the symptoms have so far, a normal evolution. So there is also a study in type 2. And then the virus is not injected intravenously but intratecally. And um, um, it's it's quite a little bit early to speak about data today. Uh, but it seems that you, you still have uh, you have an improvement that, that is over in the range of, of the New Zealand century patients. But we must emphasize that it's only the two first doses and we don't have yet the data for the third and highest doses. So, what is the realistic expectations for Avexis treatment? For patients less than 7 months, 40 points on the shopping terms over 5 months, like the high proportion of sitters. In type 1, more than 7 months, we don't have data. In type 2, we don't have yet strong data. In pre-symptomatic patients, we still have this normal or normal. And in patients are pre-symptomatic with three of these to be normal. So there's also the possibility to interfere with uh, the splicing of exon 7 using small molecules like Rizdiplam and Branaplam. So um, this was the initial paper uh, in science of this uh, Rizdiplam showing a very good effect in mice. And it has given rise to a huge clinical development program in SMA type 1, in SMA type 2, type 3, and now in presymptomatic patients. So, um, in patients with type 1, there is a study that is called a firefish. And uh, the difference. 
Okay? And uh, the specificity of, of this population in firefish is that they were quite old when we enrolled them in the study. They were as a median uh, nearly seven months old, and that was the median. Nevertheless, they had quite a good evolution. On 21 patients, uh, three died uh, within one year. And, and the other survived without permanent ventilation. Um, and in the cohort of patients who have been treated with the ISOs, we have reached 41% of sitters. So this is the evolution of, of this patient. This one is quite funny. He, he was crying too much that specific day, so he was recording to score very low, but basically uh, the day after he was doing better, but yeah, it was recorded like this. So this is uh, three videos of these patients, of, the, of a patient, can, can we see here? So in the first video uh, there, uh, she's a typical type 1 patient. Uh, you know, with very distal movements. Um, next. Next. After six months, she has now a good head support. Next. And she finally acquired the uh, autonomous sitting position after like the month of treatment. We have also data in type 2 and type 3 using a scale that is called the MFM scale. And we studied this scale in a population of patients who was exactly the same as in the trial, just before conducting the trial. So this is the change of, of the patients without treatment over one year. And as you may appreciate, they are between the age, they, 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 they are in a corridor of minus three or plus three over one year, so they don't change that much over one year period, and uh, they so never gain more than three But if we take the treated patients during one year, they, they, they are doing better. We must be very careful because it's not the same group of patients, it's not the same study. But an important point is the possibility to improve even for patients who are the age of 10, 11, 12 years. This guy was 21 years. So this possibility of having a very significant improvement of 3 points even in very old patients is quite interesting. So uh, now the phase three is ongoing. Um, so what is the realistic expectation uh, for Rizikman? Um, oh, sorry, I have to complete this. But in, in, in patients type, type 1, 5 to 7 months old, they improve by 15 points on the shopping tent. And we have 40% of sitters. 
третьих пациентов первого типа наблюдается ряд улучшений и 40% процентов могут сидеть. И patients of type one more than seven months we don't have data so far. Пациенты с первого же типа старше семи месяцев тоже проходили лечение, но данных они нет. In patients with type 2 or type 3, if they are less than 11 years old, we may expect an improvement on the MFM by 3.5 points. But if they are older than 11 years old, the improvement is not that good. And in presymptomatic patients, we have no data so far. So the conclusions of this uh, first talk is that several approaches have reached patients' bedside. <laughs> to compare treatment between each other is very difficult because it's different studies with different design and different population, so it's very difficult today to say this treatment is better than that treatment. So, except in presymptomatic patients, there is no possibility of cure in patients after the onset of symptoms, so none of this disease, none of this drug has demonstrated to be able to cure the patients um, after uh, the initiation of symptoms. You can improve the patients, you can treat him, but you cannot cure him as long as the patient is already symptomatic. Early treatment is always better. Whatever is the treatment, the earliest is the best. It has been a constant demonstration along all the different <coughs> clinical trials conducted in this disease. All data has been obtained in patients under standard of care. It means that if the case if the kid is like one meter fifty and fifteen kilo, if he's not properly ventilated, is not properly fed, if it's not if he has not a good bone health. Um, you cannot expect the same uh, improvement with this medication. All this medication need kids on standard of care. And I think that we all have to push as a community for newborn screening and presymptomatic treatment because it is unsustainable to continue treating patients post-symptomatic. Because let's imagine that every year you have 50 or 60 newborns in, in Russia with type 1 and these patients were supposed to die and you help them to survive and 50, 50 of them survive, then they will need to be ventilated, they will need to see the ophthalmologist, they will need the rehabilitation doctor and every year you will build a pool of patients. And it's going to be very difficult to be sustainable for your social health care. So if we want things to be sustainable, we have to treat patients post-symptomatic today, but we have to move as fast as possible to pre-symptomatic patients to avoid constituting this huge population of post-symptomatic patients that we will not be able collectively to take care of. So it is very important, even for post-symptomatic patients of today, even for existing patients of today, to push as a community to treat pre-symptomatic patients to avoid constructing a big snowball of patients who need ventilation and that we will not be able to take care of. <laughs> Каждый год в России, скажем так, ожидает 
research disadvantages of asthma. Очень важно обнаружить это заболевание при рождении. Вообще эти пациенты обычно умирают, но если они выживают, условно говоря, 50 процентов выжить, им нужна будет помощь в вентиляции легких, реабилитационные процедуры и так далее. То есть с каждым годом эти пациенты будут продолжать жить, расти, и будут добавляться новые пациенты в эту когорту, и нужна будет помощь, нужна будет социальная защита. И очень важно, чтобы эту защиту обеспечить и вести правильное лечение. Для этого чрезвычайно важно обнаруживать быстро это заболевание, как у пресимптоматических пациентов, так и у постсимптоматических, которые потом будут нуждаться в реабилитации всю жизнь. И э, более, э, опять же повторяю, что чем раньше э, обнаружить и начать лечение, тем лучше. So I think it's something very important to take is that newborn screening and presymptomatic treatment is important even for patients who exist today. Um, and, and we should really push as a community for that. если они есть, или оставить на послеобеденную вторую лекцию. Есть ли какие-то вопросы о аудитории, которые хотелось бы вот прямо сейчас задать? Будьте любезны, скажите, пожалуйста, сколько стоит одно исследование скрининга? investment, uh, the technicians, the manpower, and so forth and so on. Today we are between 3.5 and 4 euros per baby. Which means that in Belgium, uh, maybe, please tell me. Which means that in Belgium we needed to screen 7,000 newborn to get one. So we needed to spend like 20,000 euros to catch a presymptomatic patient. In Belgium, for example, we need to provide screening. 7000 детей, чтобы выявить одного больного. То есть мы тратим 20 тысяч евро на выявление пресимптоматических пациентов. A life in the wheelchair with a ventilation and rehabilitation and scoliosis cost about 5 million to the society. Жизнь в инвалидном кресле с вентилятором, где есть процедуры для реабилитации, стоит обществу 5 миллионов евро. То есть, если вы инвестируете 20 тысяч, вы можете получить 5 миллионов. A little bit more complex because probably we treat more patients because we don't let them die, we treat them before they die. So maybe we treat more patients, but at the end of the day, it, I think my primary hypothesis is that it's one of the best investments that you can make as a society if you make the decision to treat these patients. If you don't treat these patients, the cheapest way is to let them die. But If you make the decision to treat these patients, the best investment you can do as a society is to screen and to treat them at birth. 
На самом деле все гораздо сложнее. Пациенты не умирают, они выживают, и их количество растет. Так вот, самая лучшая инвестиция, что можно сделать, так это инвестировать в скрининг. И, конечно, если вы хотите лечить этих пациентов, если вы не хотите, то самое дешевое – это ноги, пусть умирают. Вот. Но я призываю инвестировать в скрининг при рождении. Скажите, пожалуйста, для лечения спинораза можно брать больных с одной копией или отсутствием копии? Гены СМР-2. Okay, uh, zero copies for sure not, because at first no copy yet. Uh, it, it's extremely rare to have a, a living kid with zero copies. And if you have zero copies, the target is not there, so you should, but you don't have a target. I'm not aware of many patients with one copy. I'm aware of one patient with one copy who is treated in Scotland. Я не знаю большого количества пациентов с одной единственной копией. Есть один в Шотландии. И мой коллега рассказал мне, что дела у него так же, как и у тех пациентов, у которых копии две. In my population of patients that we have published, and in the population, the German population that has been published, there was no difference in the outcome of the treatment in patients with SMA type 1 if they have two or with three copies of SMA 2. So it means that the number of copies was not an indicator of patient's response as long as they had type 1. А, будь у них две копии или три, то есть количество копий в данном случае не является показателем ответ, ответной реакции организма на медикамент. Спасибо большое. Спасибо большое, Лариан, за